chapter 20. Uh, we talked to last week about the, the God's purpose for the commandments. Uh, understand one of the major reasons was that uh, the children of Israel had come out of uh, the bondage of Egypt and they were very accustomed to polytheistic worship. Uh, they served, there was many gods. Uh, and God in the very first commandment is, uh, as he hands it down to Moses, is influencing them and encouraging them to realize that they are a monotheistic nation. Uh, they're to worship one God, the one and true God, Jehovah God. Uh, Adonai, Yahweh, however you, whatever you want to say, the many titles that he has. Uh, but th that was the goal uh, of basically the, of the Ten Commandments, uh, the basic of the law. Uh, that really it could never justify from sin. Uh, and by the way, you can keep the commandments all you want to, and it'll never just justify you from sin. Uh, it can never give you righteousness. Uh, it, Paul, it can never give peace, keeping the Ten Commandments. Well, why do we have them? Well, Paul said in the book of Galatians, they're, they're a schoolmaster. Uh, they're to lay down the structure to bring us to a relationship with Christ. So understand that. They're principles. They're guidelines for us to follow and, and to set the standards for our uh, life around uh, really three reasons for this commandment was given. This commandment that we're looking at, the second commandment, uh, as he talks about in verse, um, he says in verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So we find the second commandment beginning in verse 4. Or thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that, that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Well, we learned, first of all, really there's three basic reasons uh, this commandment was given. We're found right here in the scriptures, particularly beginning in verse 5. Uh, God's a jealous God, uh, and God is jealous for his glory. Uh, and we need to give him the glory. He's worthy of all the glory and the honor and praise. And any time we give glory to anything else or any other God, we're robbing him of his glory. Secondly, uh, the second reason we find this commandment was given was to change, uh, uh, to 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 change his glory. Uh, to change his glory is to is really to to rebel or to hate to hate him or show hatred toward him. And thirdly, those who glorify him as he is are are blessed by him. Uh, there in verse six, there's a blessing comes to those who will uh, glorify him in their lives. Well. We've already discovered the first commandment tells us who God is. Uh, the second commandment uh, teaches us how we're to worship God. Okay, uh, Does it matter who we worship? Sure it does. Uh, does it matter how we worship? Sure it does. And there's so many biblical examples and measures that you find in the Word of God when it deals with worship. The first commandment actually teaches us to worship the right God. The second says that we're not to worship the right God in the wrong way. Okay, uh, he says in verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So he describes every different facet here of possibility of creating something to worship. Now, let me just say there's an inner drive in every creature to worship something, okay? Uh, we know that. You can study cultures all across this world, uh, and history proves that, that there is an inner drive for people to worship someone or something. Well, first of all, what is prohibited in worship? That's the question as we think about this, uh, these no graven images. What is the, what, what's prohibited in worship? Well, uh, Paul actually here is, uh, you can actually do a real close reference to Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn over there for just a moment, and you'll see Paul uh, really addresses that very thoroughly uh, as we think about graven images. Paul describes really here uh, in Romans really the basic root, okay, of all the isms of religion. 
Uh, and you know there's many of them, just to mention a few. Humanism uh, is one we face today. Buddhism, Mormonism, Hinduism, Catholicism. Uh, all those isms are, are different uh, um, belief systems or patterns that take away and, and they become graven images, okay, and take away and rob God of his glory. Uh, it, it's sad to think, if you think about this, uh, realize tonight that People stand for hours in long lines in the cathedrals of Europe in order to bow down and kiss the toes of a statue of Peter. Uh, I've been to Nicaragua several times and watched some of those folks. And inside some of those Catholic churches, they have windows. And in those windows, they have replicas or, or, or uh, different structures out of plastic or whatever. Some of them may be wax. But all through that building of different individuals, and they, you watch them as they come in. Uh, and, and many times they go from window to window to window, uh, bowing down and worshiping to those individuals. Folks, those are only people, okay? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the living God. And what they've done is they have created graven images. They're bowing down and worshiping something that is fleshly or man-made. Well, go to Romans chapter 1. Paul addressed that same subject in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God, and here it is, is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, okay? Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So every single person that's ever been born is without excuse because the creation, listen, the creator and the creation is evidence that there is a Godhead, that there is a God. Okay, uh, he says in verse 20, he says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because, but here's the problem, verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Here's what they did in verse 23. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God uh, into an image made like to the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Realizing they've done this, he says in the next verse, verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Okay, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served, here it is, and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So understand, as you look and see some of the movement that are going on today across America and across this world, that's exactly what mankind's done. We've substituted the create the creature for the creator. Okay, uh, we've made people gods. We, we've made um, we've made um, relationships God, and we got to be very careful of that. Well. There's two basic reasons we find that God prohibits the making of images. Uh, first of all, it distorts God. When we make an image, it distorts God. Well, anything that takes away from God is going to distort his deity. Uh, and, and that's exactly what was happening. Uh, as we study uh, the, the children of God, and you understand that the children of Israel have come out of a polytheistic worship. They've, learned, they've seen the many gods of Egypt, and they, there's a temptation there uh, for them to serve those gods. And later on, you're going to find that they did serve those gods, uh, and they departed from the living God. Uh, the Jehovah God. But as you, as we think about this thing of making images, uh, we see what's prohibited in worship. Uh, when we substitute things for God and worship things instead of God, it, uh, listen, it distorts God. Jesus said in John 4, 24, he said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that very clearly tells me that you can't worship, listen, you can't truly worship Him without the Spirit. 
Why? Because the Father agrees with the Son and the Son agrees with the Spirit. They're all three in agreement, okay? You'll never find one saying anything contradictory or the other. So, and, and by the way, the Bible actually authenticates uh, the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to take the Word and authenticate it. The Bible, listen, God's never going to tell you something or the Holy Spirit's never going to teach you to do something that's contrary to what God's Word says. And I hear people say all the time, well, I know what the Bible says, but... Well, listen, there, there's no such thing as Billy Goat, Billy Goat Christianity, okay? And we got a lot of that, okay? Listen, when there's a principle that's laid out in the Word of God, for us to change that, we're, we're, we're dipping in and leading maybe to making a graven image. So when we think about this thing of making an image, first of all, it distorts God. It takes away from His deity. Folks, so as you think about the Spirit of God tonight, the Spirit of God's job is to introduce you to Jesus. His role and His responsibility is to introduce you to Jesus, to invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and to indwell you so you can have a fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, you see, spiritual activity and worship are not the same, okay? Don't miss that. Spiritual activity and worship are not the same. We have to have the indwelling Spirit of God. Listen, the we have to have the indwelling Spirit of God to truly, honestly worship God. Uh, we've got a lot, of, a lot of wrong teaching, a lot of false doctrine when it comes to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. There's some things today uh, all around us, and we, we Jude and I needed had to go to Concord today. And he was telling me about one of his friends visited a certain church in our area, uh, just 11-year-old. And uh, he actually had bruises on his back where he would, somebody in the church was beating him, try, say, saying that he, he needed to be slain in the spirit. And these people were in the floor, and they were doing all kind of radical things. Folks, I, I, and I had, took the opportunity to tell him and explain to him the doctrine of speaking in tongues. He wanted to know what it was about. I seized that opportunity. I said, Judah, you, you need to be cautious of those things. I said, because that, that, that's flesh. That's not biblical. Uh, but anyhow, I move on to say this. You see, Satan uh, will use anything and set up anything to distort God's image. God is holy. He never ceases to be holy. He'll always be holy. He's righteous, sovereign God. And for us to create a substitute or a graven image is a dangerous thing. Uh, so we see what's prohibited in worship. Uh, when we create idols or substitute something for God, it distorts God. But secondly, it, only, it degrades God. Uh, you see, it's impossible for... Let me go back for just a moment and, and to that other point, though. Journey back with me for just a moment in your biblical knowledge uh, to uh, this thing of distorting God. You remember Daniel? You remember what Nebuchadnezzar did in chapter 3? Anybody remember what he did? He set up a statue that was 90 foot tall and it was 6 feet wide. Now, can you, you imagine? And here he is, and what he, 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 he set up that statue, and he commanded everybody that would not bow to, the, the, to this idol would be thrown into a fiery furnace. But you know what Daniel did? Daniel says, listen, I'm not bowing to that. He, you, know what da, you know what Nebuchadnezzar was doing? Nebuchadnezzar was trying to distort God. He was trying through this structure to create a pagan God. And Daniel says, I'm not bowing to that. I will not bow to that. I only serve Jehovah God. So what he did, he says, listen, Daniel says, you will not distort my God. And folks, when we honor the, the Ten Commandments, this commandment in particular, we're saying when we have no graven images, listen, to the world, you will not distort my God. And every single day, listen, our generation is trying to distort God. And by the way, when they distort Jesus Christ, they're distorting God. Amen. I watched Franklin Graham today as he gave an interview about some of the presidential things and the shoot and all that stuff and how eloquent he was when I asked him why he w was going to pray and all these things. Man, he handled it sharp, very sharp, uh, of how uh, we need to turn back to God. And you may have watched that, and I'll, I'll move on past that. But anyhow, it, secondly, it distorts God when we have images. Uh, secondly, it degrades God, as I've already said. You see, it's impossible. Listen to this statement I'm going to make. It is impossible for a material image to represent a spiritual God. 
It's impossible for a frog or a goat or a, or a fly or whatever it is, a snake, any of those things that they worship back in, 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 in um, Egypt to, to represent God. You see, and listen, God can't hear any, listen, God can hear, God can hear an image can't, right? God can hear an image can't. And I feel sorry for those folks who are praying to a statue or an image. Listen, that image is not going to hear them. But thank God we serve the true and the living God. We have a God who can communicate with us. He communicates with us through the Holy Spirit. He communicates us through His Word. Amen? We can have fellowship with Him uh, through our relationship. Uh, So again... God can hear, an image can't. God can aid his people in a time of trouble, but an image can't, can it? Uh, image, uh, Buddha can't solve anybody's problem. I've never seen Buddha, heard about Buddha coming off of a platform somewhere and running to somebody's house and helping them in a the crisis. But I have heard, listen, I have heard about God working supernaturally through prayer and through the scripture and through God's people and helping other people. I've seen him answer prayer in my life, seen him answer prayer in other people's lives. You see, it's a sad thing if we serve a dead God, isn't it? Thank God we serve the living God. I'm reminded of 1 Kings 18 when I think about this thing of degrading God. You remember Elijah there uh, faced those prophets of Baal, and he went out and he doused that altar three different times, uh, and he doused it down, and finally he he got to the point and their God didn't do anything. They began to lance themselves and scream and cry because their God wouldn't answer. But uh, Elijah says, hey, uh, douse, that, douse that altar. And he, he said, go get water and douse it. He did that three times. And he called down fire from heaven. And the Bible says that the fire came from heaven and God consumed that altar. Amen. You know what they were doing? They were trying to degrade God. You see, uh, as we think about degrading God, most of us, we don't like to see a bad picture taken of us, do we? Now, some of us, when somebody's going to take a snapshot, uh, we do, and you, you, some, of, some folks say, well, don't take that side, get my good side. Well, let me just be honest with you. Some of us ain't got a good side, okay? Uh, but I hate pictures. But as you think about this thing of, of a picture, you know, when we think about this thing of, of a, uh, a graven image, we, we want our good side to be reflected, don't we? And so for some reason, some of the worst pictures we take is when we go to the uh, DMV, isn't it? I mean, it looks like you just got out of jail, don't it? Like you're, you just had a smug mug shot taken. But you know what? None of us like to be misrepresented, do we? A lot of women, they, they hate for you to see the, a picture of their driver's license. Well, let me just say this. God doesn't like to be misrepresented either. Listen, God doesn't like to be compared to a bug. He doesn't like to be compared to a frog, a fly, a dog, a fish, a beast. And by the way, he don't like to be compared to a pagan man either. Amen. He's king of kings, lord of lords. He is the great I I am. He does not want any substitutes. He's God. He, he depends on nobody to make him God. Listen, we don't have to prove anything or set up some structure. Listen, to prove who he is, he's God. Amen. But we see the greatest image of him through his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless, spotless, perfect life so he could be the sacrifice for our sins. Well, we see what's prohibited in worship, uh, things that distort God, things that would degrade God and who he is. Uh, Secondly, we see what's protected in worship. Look at verse 5. He says, Thou shalt bow down thyself to them. I'm in the wrong chapter. Yeah, no, I'm not. He says, Thou shalt not make into thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Look what he says. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. A jealous God. Uh, jealousy, when you think about this word jealous, he's really just, he's talking about zeal. He's a zealous God. Uh, jealousy is a zeal to protect a relationship. 
Listen, it, mean, it really is a Hebrew word that means to be inflamed or on fire. So as you understand that, when you and I come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have entered a covenant relationship much like the covenant relationship between a husband and a wife. And when we get saved and we give our heart and life to God, we come into a covenant relationship, a contractual relationship with Him. And therefore, listen, I belong to Him and He belongs to me. I have a responsibility. And listen, He is jealous. He doesn't want me bound to other gods. He's the one who died for me. He's the one who convicted me of sin. He's the one that born me again. He's the one that invited me into the family of God. And listen, he will accept no more substitutes. He doesn't want any substitutes. He wants to be on the throne of my heart and the throne of your heart and life. And you see, uh, because of God's zeal, he desires three things, really. First of all, uh, God wants your total life. He wants all of you. He don't want some of you. And I think one of the greatest things we've done is we failed to teach the Lordship of Jesus in many of our churches. Listen, there is responsibility, uh, and, and there is responsibility, and there is accountability when you say that you belong to Jesus Christ. God wants your total life. Listen to 1 John chapter 5. Verse 11 through verse 13, John says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is, listen, he, notice this phrase, and this life is in his Son. Folks, eternal life is not being a Baptist or a Methodist or, or any other denominational characteristic. Listen, this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, verse 13, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, there's a great opportunity here. Uh, there's great, a great obligation. So as we think about this thing of worship, uh, God desires, uh, He wants your total life. He don't want a little bit of it. Uh, he wants all of it. He wants you to yield to Him. Secondly, God wants your complete love. Look at that same chapter, John, 1 John 5, verse 2 and 3. He said, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. There's the acid test. You can tell me you love God all you want to, but unless you, listen, unless you love other people, unless you love the children of God, unless you love people, and unless you keep His commandments, He clearly says you're a liar. Bottom line, I didn't say it either. God says it. He says there, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. It's not difficult for us to keep. It's not a burden for us uh, to, to do his commandments. We want to obey them because we know that honor to him. God wants your total life. God wants your complete love. But thirdly, God wants your total loyalty. Uh, Romans chapter 12 Verse 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Look at it on the screen. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, except unto God, which is your reasonable service. Think about that verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I've used this verse multiple, multiple times and broke it down and paraphrased it. He simply says, listen, he said, as we go, think about that, uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, he says in that verse, he, what a powerful statement. Uh, he said there, there's a transformation that took place when you accepted Jesus Christ. And, and listen, don't be fashion like the world, but there ought to be a daily tearing down, a demolition process that takes place. And he says in verse 1, uh, he says, this is your reasonable service. The least you can do because of what he's done is to present your body a living sacrifice daily. That's why you shouldn't have any graven images in your life. There shouldn't be any other gods, little gods, or things that you bow to, statues, monuments, uh, whatever it may be, activities. Why? Because he wants your total loyalty. And we, you can jot this down. I'm not going to turn there tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 30 Verse 17 through verse 20. Powerful, powerful reference there. So we see what's prohibited in worship. We see what's protected in worship. But then as we go back to verse 5 and verse 6 of chapter 20, we see what's protected in worship. Okay? And he says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, the first thing he does here is he talks of a visitation of misery, okay? Uh, 
some believe in this text that, that sometimes that children can pay a terrible price because of parents' disobedience. That's probably true. I, I don't bl- in some realms that there's truth to that. Okay, we reap what we sow, and believe it or not, we're, we're handing down to the next generation. We're handing something down to them. We're handing down principles to them that they need to follow. But they still have a choice. Okay, uh, some believe that this is, this is a a generational warning here. But keep in mind, uh, there are some things that are generational. But and there's some things that are, that are genetic. Okay, we carry forth that sin nature. You ever notice when you go to the doctor, the first thing they want to do when they start doing a, a bad little uh, survey, when you fill out all those forms that you've already went online and filled out before you got there, and you get to the office and they want you to fill them out again? Can I get an amen? You nurses, I'm sorry. All right, so, uh, Renee does that for me. She goes on there. And does all my medicine because I take stuff that I can't keep up with. I keep a little card in my wallet, and I hate writing that stuff down. Uh, but anyhow, I get she does all that so I can just walk right through, and I say, praise the Lord. But every now and then you'll get somebody, either it didn't go through or they didn't look at it, and they're going to insist that you take that clipboard and that ink pen, and you're going to fill out that clip. Amen? That's so fun, isn't it? All right. I'm say that to say this. Why do they do that? Why do they go? Why, the last time I went, the, uh, the doctor realized that I, I, two of my sisters have died from um, aneurysms, and he began to ask me some questions and some things that to sort of target. And he, they want to know: Is there any cancer? Is there any heart problems? You don't know why? Is there any diabetes? You don't know why? Because there's some things that that they're uh, that they're genetic. Okay, we know that, and we've got a genetic nature, really a spiritual genetic nature from from Adam's sin, and we have that potential to sin. So we need to realize we all have the potential to have a graven image. But what he's doing here is the reason he's saying this, I believe, uh, that's one application. But the other reason he's saying that is he's talking about uh, the iniquity of fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. He's showing us the effects of sin and how, effect, how sin can affect every generation. Listen, and what we bow down to and worship and the traditions that we establish now, listen, they can be very dangerous if they're not biblical. Don't miss that. And there's preachers everywhere today battling over traditions that were established years ago that don't make a hill of beans and they're not even in the Word of God. And there's still people in denominations today that are following tradition and they'll follow tradition instead of yielding to truth. I know people are going to churches right now. You, you can talk to them. I dealt with a gentleman. Uh, several years back, he was a devout Catholic. He was raised in the Catholic Church. He got under conviction and broke before God. I began to counsel with him and talk with him and show him clearly in the Scriptures why he needed to be saved. That just being, being a Catholic and, and going through the catechism and all that was not a means of salvation. I explained to him thoroughly. He got to the point where he was going to pray and receive Christ and broke my heart. And he said, I am forsaking my mama's tradi- uh, uh, religious history if I accept Christ. I said, you could be kidding me. I said, I've shown you the truth. He said, no. And he said, maybe some other time. I haven't seen him in years. But I don't know if he ever got things right, but I sincerely doubt it because he was so ingrained in what they had taught him with tradition. He rejected truth. You know why? Because he had been raised to serve a graven image. You know, the other flip side of that's this. <laughs> I knew a, a pastor friend that uh, had a rude, insulting man in his church that he pastored. He was critical of every single thing the pastor did, and he let it be known week after week. His son got put in jail, this true story. His son got put in jail for a crime that he committed, and that man called the pastor and said, Will you go speak to my son? And the preacher went. He began to share the Lord with the young man, and he said, The Lord? Man, what are you talking about? He said, My daddy's talked about you and made fun of you and the church for so long. I really don't think there's anything you can do to help me. I'd really rather serve some kind of other image. Well, 
You see, graven images can come in all types of ways. Okay, sometimes it can be bitterness. Sometimes it can be anger. Sometimes it, it can be not only a a physical device; it can be a spiritual or a um, personality trait. If we're not careful, and then there are several references here in Second Chronicles twenty six, verse sixteen, chapter twenty seven, chapter twenty eight. I'm not going to go to every one of those tonight. But secondly, he only talks of a visitation of misery in this commandment, in this thing of what is protected in worship, the visitation of misery. But he also talks about the visitation of mercy. Thank God. Look at in verse 6. He, he, time verse 5 and verse 6 together. He says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Look at the parallel here. There, there's a, there is a cost. There's a cost for, for hating God. But there's also a reward for acknowledging God. For not making any graven images. For honoring Him. He talks of a visitation of mercy. Folks, I look around me today. Thank God that the, our forefathers established this country. Listen, hanging the Ten Commandments on the wall of our courthouses and our schools and all across America. It laid the foundation and the structure of the establishment of our nation. And when we forsake that and we say we don't want that, look at the consequences. Look at the things that have happened in the last, uh, the, the last 10, 15 years uh, all around us in our schools, in our churches, and in our communities. God says, okay, you don't want me. If you want something else, I'll let you have something else. That's just our God. He loves us that much. He gives us a choice. Either we want to honor Him and love Him and respect Him and, and worship Him. Or he'll let us reject him. He's not going to force us to do anything. But we, we do need to know there's consequences when we don't. I say that to say this in closing tonight. We've got to ask ourselves tonight a couple things. First of all, what kind of image, what kind of image are we leaving our children in our worship, in our witness, in our walk of life? What what kind of image are we leaving for our children? Are we consistently letting them know that He's God and we don't have any little gods? We haven't made any graven images? Secondly, what kind of graven images do we need to be avoiding in our life? They're potentially all around us. Anything that takes the place of God can become a graven image. When we begin to bow to it, when we begin to give more, more of time to it than we do God, okay? You'll have to do your own, own math of your time, where you're spending your time, or that you're spending with God, or you're spending with other activities. That's between you and God, okay? But what kind of graven images do we need to be avoiding before our children? <laughs> the bottom line is this, folks. As we, as we look at that second commandment, when we turn, don't, don't miss this statement, when we turn to substitutes for God, it's a clear sign that our hearts have shifted. Don't miss that. That's why we have this commandment. That's why he gave this commandment to the children of Israel and to the people of God, to you and I, is so our hearts won't shift. Because when our hearts have shifted, usually we've, we've put something in the place of God in our lives and when we begin to see and observe that we've put other things or other people or other things in the place of God guess what we've just established a graven image why because it's taken the place of God and we're, we're bowing our time we're bowing our energy we're bowing our resources our financial means we're bowing to, to that object instead of our relationship and fellowship with the true and the living God wow powerful powerful so there's really a, a, a caution in this commandment, but there's also a celebration in this commandment. Thank God. <laughs> I, I, thank God that he shows us mercy. He doesn't give us what we deserve. We all deserve hell. Amen? But through Jesus Christ, he's shown us mercy and grace and give us his goodness. Why in the world would we want to worship anything else or anyone else? Knowing what he did for us on Calvary. Amen? When you get a fresh glimpse of what he's done for you and you journey back to what he's done in your life, 
Why in the world would you want anything else to be on the heart of your life, or on the throne of your heart? Amen? He gave his life's blood so that you could spend eternity in heaven and not spend eternity in hell. Amen? He deserves first. He doesn't want second. Amen? Let's all stand. Danny, if you'll come tonight, play for us. We've got our heads about and eyes closed. Uh, right straight to the point tonight. I wonder tonight if there's some structure in your in your walk with God or is there some structure in your life that you need to readjust maybe your time with God um, maybe there's some things you put before God or before um, before your prayer time before the your time of the word um, maybe there's some things that you found yourself spending more time with than you are God it has the potential of becoming a graven image uh, that's a challenge for you to look closely tonight into your heart and your life and evaluate where you're at. You see, the Holy Spirit, His responsibility is to convict you and to draw you to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ and to point out those faults and those shortcomings that you might have that could be setting the stage for you to bow down to something greater than God in your life. You see, Satan's goal is to set traps for you and to lure you away from a relationship and fellowship. You see, he wants you to forget about the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God and serve something or someone else instead of the true and the living God. Maybe he's, you recognize tonight that He's robbed you, pulled you away by some means tonight. And you need to seize this opportunity to come back to a relationship and fellowship with him that you might have used to had. Father, again, I've been obedient as I know how to explain this commandment, to make it applicable to our lives, and Lord, how powerful it is. And Lord, I realize that there's not a one of us that are in this church tonight that are exempt from uh, substituting things for you if we're not very careful. And we have to be very conscious of that as long as we serve you, that you'll, you'll, you'll have no substitutes. Lord, you want to be the King of kings and Lord of lords on our heart. Lord, I pray that we'd be mindful of those things tonight and speak to our hearts and encourage us uh, that uh, if there's things that you point out that we need to address, that we'll, we'll recognize those things and we'll repent of those things and uh, let you be first place. Those things that might have become graven images, those things that might be on the verge of becoming a graven image, I pray that you'd uh, cleanse us and help us to recognize those things that we could wouldn't go down the wrong path. In Jesus' name, amen. Denny's going to play.